All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to the April 2020 International Community of Interest monthly lecture series. I hope all of you are doing well. Had a good Easter weekend and uh, enjoyed uh, some rest and relaxation this past weekend and are uh, excited as we are to be back with you again uh, to deliver today's session, which uh, here in just a moment, we'll do the introductions and, and get the presentation off and running. Uh, but what I want to do first here is just provide a little bit of uh, some uh, some preemptory uh, information for you and put up here on the on this first slide uh, what we've got in the uh, in the lineup for you going into the month of May. So we're here on the 8th of April, in case you weren't sure where you were at. Uh, for the uh, for the presentation from U.S. Southern Command. Uh, and then into May, we're not going to have an early May event. Uh, we're going to focus all of our energies on bringing great content to you during the virtual JETC uh, the week of the 17th of May. So as you can see on there, we're looking to do our, our annual business meeting, and we'll be sending out information on how to get into that, uh, into that lineup. It would be great to see you there to get your feedback and to help uh, get your input and how we can make this event uh, and make this lecture series even better for you as we go forward. Uh, and then on the 19th and 20th, you can see a couple of great panel sessions that we've got lined up. Uh, really looking forward to uh, both of these. Uh, one, looking at the political dynamics uh, and those effects on planning and delivering military infrastructure. And then the second one, which is really an update on a, on a uh, lecture that we, a panel session, sorry, that we delivered for you back in September of last year on the state of play in virtual charrettes and designer views. So that should be a really good one. Uh, after that, we've got a couple of master master classes lined up. We, we understand from all the feedback that people really enjoy those uh, enjoy those events. And I, I'm certainly looking forward to the one in June. Uh, and so I'm always looking forward to information on planning and programming. Uh, and then we've got uh, AFRICOM uh, set up for us in July. And then I am still looking for good, uh, good panel participants for uh, early days here now looking for this this panel that we're going to run in September, which is really looking at uh, making MILCON outside the continental United States net or near zero. So uh, if you're involved in that in the work that you do uh, or know someone in your in your company or, or your organization that is uh, involved with that, uh, please have them get in contact with me or you yourself, please get in contact with me. It'd be great to hear from you. All right. So that's a little bit of the uh, kind of the preemptory. Uh, the slide deck's available for you to download. In fact, if you just go to the hands up, handouts uh, tab on your screen there, you can download uh, all the slide, the, the full slide deck. Uh, the, uh, we always get the question, is this you know, the PD, is the PDH form available? It is. It's at the back, the last slide in the handouts uh, deck. So please go download that. And you can also get this uh, slide here, which is slide number two in that deck, which will give you all the different presentations. Uh, coming up in the lecture series. All right, so before we jump into today's presentation, I'd like you to come in and if you could just share with us, give us a little bit of demographics so we know who we've got in the audience today. Always good to have an understanding of who we're, uh, who we're speaking with. I think that's like 101 on uh, presentations, just to kind of know who, uh, who you're talking with. And uh, we're getting a good mix in here, government, um, seems to be kind of the uh, the lead play, so that's always good to see that our our uh, government uh, government members are in here. And we'll go ahead and close this thing down now. So we've got uh, got a good mix of uh, of government uh, participants today, which again is always good to have uh, government participation in this. Uh, and then a, a kind of an even mix between uh, small and large uh, AE consultancies. So great to have uh, you on here. Great to have everyone on here. And with that, I do want to now turn it over to Blake Bach, who's going to do the introduction and moderate today's session. So, Blair, over to you. Hey, Chris, thank you. I appreciate it. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, it is certainly my pleasure today to introduce you to Colonel Dave Noble. You can see the fun facts about him. Um, it really shows that, that Dave is, is truly a Renaissance guy. But from his, his biography, He's a COCOM engineer in U.S. Southern Command. He's with a battalion commander of the 40th Engineer Battalion. He had multiple USACE assignments to include in Iraq and Afghanistan. Uh, he was the garrison commander for Camp Patriot while he was the battalion commander for the 40th. But you're not selected for co to be a COCOM engineer unless you have inc incredibly impressive credentials. So D Dave certainly does. But I'm most impressed by Dave, and I've always been most impressed by Dave, not just these fun facts, but by his choice in friends, beer and cigars. So with that, Dave, ladies and gentlemen, Colonel Dave Noble, it's over to you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for that introduction. Always good to start off with a, uh, a, a good laugh. Hey, so I'm Dave Noble. I'm, I'm located with U.S. Southern Command at the headquarters uh, in Miami, Florida. It, it's definitely uh, one of the more hardship tours um, that I've faced in recent history. Um, but as, as, you, uh, as presented before, I, I am the, the Combatant Command Engineer, and I've been in position since last summer. Um, however, from June till now, there's definitely been a whirlwind of experiences to include real-world operations. And, and uh, through the purpose and agenda today, uh, I'm looking forward to highlight um, one of the most climactic events that I've experienced within the command as well as as a uh, senior military engineer. And so um, uh, I, I will be presenting throughout um, with the, the scripted lecture and then, you know, obviously questions, conversations throughout at, at the discretion of the, the group. Um, but with that, I'll, I'll give a sense of what Southern Command is all about. So SOUTHCOM, it's a joint military command that supports U.S. national security objectives across the Americas. This is the Western Hemisphere between the Caribbean, Central, and South America. Uh, we work with our partner nations, U.S. government, interagency, and a network of non-government organizations to strengthen our relationships, which we've built on trust, respect, and mutual benefit. Uh, within Southern Command, we do uh, make every opportunity to attempt the, to emphasize that our partners are actually also our neighbors, and we operate within the neighborhood. And so with the neighborhood, what we highlight here is a, and a reemergence of long-term strategic competition from the national security uh, strategy. There are challenges to create a, co a competitive mindset, but with Southcom's competitive advantage, it is possible through our lines of effort. The national defense strategy challenges us to create a competitive space as such, we seek to partner with our professional militaries uh, across the entire neighborhood. And, and being able to share our information and intelligence rapidly, rapidly is vital to be the best possible partner for security. We also share culture, history, and values with, with our fellow uh, partner nations across the neighborhood. Uh, for example, about 20% of the U.S. population is of Latin American, Hispanic descent. And so there's, there's a lot of commonality touch points within which we, we represent. We operate within 28 democracies that admittedly are at varying stages of maturity, but they're all grounded in Western European en enlightenment thought. In, the, in this area, you can also see that there are some challenges that we face within the region uh, using terms like the vicious circle of threats. That includes three global actors in China, Russia, and to a lesser degree, Iran, but also regional actors in Nicaragua, Venezuela, and Cuba. Um, that round out our 31 countries in our, in our neighborhood. Um, the, they do seek to negatively impact the region in various ways, from the spreading of misinformation to the sponsorship of international terrorism and exploitation of the limitations and, and challenges faced with each individual nation, whether it's through illegal, unsolicited, un, unrecorded uh, uh, mining, fishing, deforestation, IUU activities, or other criminal activities um, across the region. Our strategy uses three lines of effort to inform the ways we apply our available means to achieve the strategy's ends. Strengthening partnerships is an ideal desired outcome of our security engagements with our partners. We perceive the region to be extremely stable, meaning it's unlikely that we'll see armed conflict between any two nation states. But we don't take this for granted. With increasing competition from state and non-state actors, we want our partners to turn to us first for any and all assistance as their trusted partner or partner of choice. Our next line of effort is countering threats, and our approach there is to leverage the entire Department of Defense's capabilities and resources in a way that assists law enforcement in order to illuminate, disrupt, and degrade illicit networks operating throughout the region. Of emphasis is counter-narcotic operations. And finally, building our team as the final line of effort at the command, we, we look to enhance the, cap the capacity of our partners to develop regional solutions to our shared issues and challenges. We do this in a number of ways, like state partnership programs with the uh, National Guard, subject matter expert exchanges, and a multitude of combined exercises across um, multiple partners within the, the entire Western Hemisphere. 
Here at Southern Command, our manning is centered around a core of about 1,300 personnel, 400 of which uh, being military, and the, mech, the rest are a mix of DOD civilians and contractors. But at any given time, there are a couple thousand sailors, soldiers, airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen conducting hundreds of activities, either working directly with our partner nations or with one of our 23 security cooperation offices that are based at embassies all across the Western Hemisphere. The SCOs help us with the responsibility of integrating country team priorities within the command initiatives to include senior key leader engagements, humanitarian assistance, and training exercises. And what you discover is whether it's Southern Command operating with the components, our joint task force, our other associated military partners, or through the SCOs in the 23 uh, established embassy locations, each country has its its own unique set of considerations. And so no one solution will fit all countries within the Western Hemisphere. In addition to the components, the services, we are also supported by three different task forces. The first one being Joint Interagency Task Force South or JIETA South. This organization is located in Key West, Florida. JIETA South has the primary mission of detecting and monitoring all illicit trafficking in the aerial and maritime domains. They monitor as far as the East Pacific, through the Caribbean, and into the Gulf of Mexico. Next, we have Joint Task Force Guantanamo or JTF Gitmo at Naval Station Guantanamo in Cuba, whose primary mission is the safe, humane, and legal care of custody of the remaining detainees, some of whom were directly, I'm sorry, hold on a second, I'm getting a, a polling request. All right, cleared that. Uh, again, as I was saying about JTF Gitmo, um, this task force is responsible for the safe, humane, legal care and custody of our remaining detainees, some of whom were directly involved in the attacks of 9-11. Of Finally, we have JTF Bravo, stationed at Sotocano Air Base in Honduras. Having this asset there allows us to be the first responders for any natural disaster, as we saw during hurricanes at an IOTA. And it also allows us to conduct training with partners across Central America and support law enforcement efforts to counter drug trafficking and other networks. So leading up, leading up to the back-to-back -back hurricanes last November, I'm talking about hurricanes Eta and Iota, the Southern Command engineer teams was in a state of transition. Most of our military members had ripped out. Um, June, I became the senior military presence outside of one of my uh, uh, Air Force Lieutenant Colonels. Um, all other military had arrived after, after me. And so we, we really relied on a stable civilian backbone for the rest of the team. Uh, we got a complement of about 12, 13 um, civilians, contractors, and military personnel within the engineer shop. Uh, the levels of competency, competency that came with that were varied regardless of individual 10 years. It, it, we have personnel that, that have been here for over a decade. However, based on the nature of uh, their assignment and, and, and responsibilities, um, they are very crafted in one area, but not so much uh, spread out more holistically. So Southcom had a pool of resources and references located across various repositories. However, navigating through what is available in the knowledge management backdrop, um, wherever it was and how it was uh, appropriately used, was, was part of the, the, the dilemma with onboarding and understanding the joint environment, let alone the engineer community. Redundancy and engineer capabilities, transitioning from a service to a joint environment and working outside typical areas of expertise was also unfamiliar for the team. And so I have experts for environmental, I have experts for construction, I have experts for operational energy, but providing in a more holistic approach of how we bring that in together to be able to add redundancy, add secondary um, uh, capabilities, add a more holistic approach kind of puts individuals outside of their comfort zones. And when you, when you go across something um, as, as similar setting as a humanitarian assistance disaster relief response, you have to operate outside of your com com comfort zone to be able to contribute to the much larger, more holistic engineer approach. The, co the COVID environment has significantly changed the manner in which in-person preparation activities were conducted. And we were up to about six months into the COVID um, adjustments here at Southern Command. It reduced exercises and rehearsals to virtual forums. Uh, this influenced crisis action training as well as in-person availability 
under the restrictions of in-person conditions on a, uh, a joint operations center floor where you would normally or typically have um, however number of people, whatever that reference is, cut it down by 10, 15%. And that was the available manpower in person due to COVID restrictions and standoff. In addition to where we were as I came into the fold last summer, I recognized and leveraged as best as possible every opportunity, the entire military engineer community of interest. And so highlighted here are the 20 plus engineer leaders that we deal with um, on a daily, weekly, and monthly basis. This includes component engineers, task force engineers, and the construction agents of USACE and NAVFAC, USACE being out of Mobile and NAVFAC being out of Jacksonville. Engagement occurs with USACE and NAVFAC daily and with redundancy weekly during internal huddles and monthly with all engineers at monthly sinks. In addition to other forums, like uh, a month ago, we held our annual engineer workshop to talk on a number of, of topical subjects, both unclass and classified. So of particular note, and I think this was one of the pre-brief requests for information and inclusion, USA's presence across Latin America is, is vast. Uh, you can see here their re ref, uh, residence offices and military presence forward in both Central and South America. The way that the construction agent breakdown is, is generally NAVFAC provides support over the Caribbean and USACE provides support over Central and South America. However, that does not limit either organization from working with each other or working in place of each other uh, based on common relationships and agreements uh, across the uh, Latin America and the, the Caribbean. So, USA's presence is facilitated through South Atlantic Division's Mobile District, and as an extension of the USACE integration, it also includes two military personnel, one in Central America, one in South America, and two USACE liaisons located here at the SOUTHCOM headquarters. Our NAFAC liaison counterpart is located in Jacksonville. So as SOUTHCOM engineers, we typically have six functional areas that we oversee on behalf of the command. These include typical staff, uh, staff functions for integration of plans, exercises, crisis response, and operations. In addition, we do oversee construction, environmental, operational energy, real estate, and other topical requirements uh, set by the commander to include quality of life and headquarters improvements. And so while I do have my six uh, standard engineer functions. I, I have also been tasked as a seventh function in terms of military construction efforts here locally as part of the commander's initiative for quality of life. Um, and so from this point on, this kind of sets the stage for everything that we will talk about, which is going to be highlighted on that bottom comment, is the contingency and crisis response specific to the hurricanes that we witnessed in um, November of last year. So when Southcom entered November, this was the tail end of the hurricane season. And so all expectations were that, all right, we made it through another season. We're going to go in, prepare, let it start up again in May. However, we had conducted an internal HADR exercise within the headquarters weeks prior. Uh, unfortunately, the level of emphasis for engineers was not as, as great as other aspects for mission command, reporting, um, intel, operations, sustainment, uh, et cetera. And so the, the, the engineer um, aspects of this was, was secondary to other primary um, command roles for the commander's ability to provide mission command. When the first hurricane struck, we, we kind of felt a little bit of that. Seven countries were affected across Central America. Now, if you go back in recent history, you go back to, let's say, Hurricanes Irma, I would say, um, there, there were activities in which there was uh, an HADR response, but we're talking about um, Haiti. We're talking about a single country at a point. And so over the last, I would say, last 10 years, what happened in November was probably the single greatest HADR uh, disaster uh, event that Southern Command had to react. And, and, um, and that's within recent history, recent history being the last decade. When Eta struck, it hit seven countries predominantly in Central America. So from the Northern Triangle all the way down to Panama, 
hitting into the cusp of Columbia. Um, it, there was there was a, a, a ripping effect as it, it swung through Honduras and Belize, and then started swinging toward uh, Cuba, threatening Cuba and South Florida. The immediate addition of IOTA, uh, like 10 days later, I believe, um, brought in the Colombian islands of Providencia and San Andreas. So it brought us up to eight countries in a short period of time that we were providing emergency response to. During the initial events, our coordination as engineers was through, in part, the, the SCOs, the Security Cooperation Offices. Their assistance with partner nation FEMA equivalent organizations resulted in some Spanish Porter, Portuguese reports. With no internal translation support, we, we had to leverage Spanish employees in-house that you know, were able to help translate or just default to something like Google Translate. Uh, and that was just because of, of limited personnel available. Southcom response was larger, was in part of a larger whole of government emergency response with USAID in the lead. Southcom's focus and emphasis from these authorities focused on life-saving activities has filtered through USAID concurrence. Of the millions of potential civilians affected, the emphasis focused on about 350,000 displaced civilians in the immediate um, stricken areas of both hurricanes, they're, they're the, the hurricane glide paths, um, as you can see uh, on here on this slide. Engineers were able to quickly and decisively integrate, you like that, right? To quickly and decisively integrate into relief efforts and command decision processes. JTF Bravo was designated as, a, as the Southcom supported command. And so they were the vanguard for all of our activities with Southcom providing that strategic support as they operated as the senior boots on the ground, operating out of Honduras and spider webbing out across other countries within the, um, the, the, the area of impact. JTF Bravo, engineer civil affairs, and other elements helped shape the larger engineer daily update on lines of communication. And that ended up being the engineer emphasis throughout the operations was how infrastructure and lines of communications were affected on the outset of these hurricanes. These points of information included roads, dams, bridges, airfields, seaports. On any given day, we were observing at a minimum over 100 nodes a hundred different specific location points that all contributed to lines of communication, whether land, sea, or air, and through which JTF Bravo Civil Affairs, other mobilized units, we were able to conduct over 40 engineer assessments across multiple countries. We were able to do this thanks to the team effort that included geospatial collection, logistics, port, port of demarcation communications, engineer and civil affairs efforts on the ground from Honduras and outward with other countries. We were also able to, as an entire engineer community, present a common picture of effects and help determine priorities and resources to respond. This included mobilization capabilities for assessments at bridges, airstrips, and dams, while leveraging existing reachback capabilities and analysis. And I, I would tell you that this contribution was not only a U.S. solution. This was a U.S. integration with each country's internal military and defense force responses aligned with their FEMA capabilities. And we ended up becoming a supplement or additive, again, proving that we were a trusted partner to each of those nations that were affected. Though not deliberately crafted at the time, we did discover afterwards, and by afterwards I mean mid-December, because this became a month-long affair for the immediate uh, life-saving activities that we were, we were overseeing at Southcom. We did discover afterwards that the engineers collectively accomplished all pre-event crisis response specified tasks. So this is part of our mission essential task list that shapes contingency and crisis response. This is all uh, predetermined specified tasks and while it felt like we were in the knife fight for the entire month, we realized that through command updates, engineer syncs, future planning and resourcing, and at times taking a step back just to look at the larger picture, it helped us to provide the best military engineer advice to the commander and the rest of the U.S. government community. And we were actually able to, whether we elected to or not, just through our sheer actions and expertise and understanding of commander's intent, we're able to accomplish all of these specified tasks. 
There was definitely a lot of on-the-job training during the events. While our pre-event preparation was adequate, it was set up at best as a foundation to pivot to the immediate needs of the specific events. Mission authorities placed a focus on the manner in which engineers could, and in some cases could not, respond. Anything life-supporting, anything supporting life-saving activities was paramount. However, a U.S. military solution to solve all problems was not necessarily the case, nor would it be approved. The relationship between the supported command, JTF Bravo, Southcom authorities nested within USAID and U.S. government positions also shaped how we communicated internally for resources and what assistance we could provide across the affected nations. There is a difference between data and context. For a commander to hear that 50 bridges have been destroyed, that may alarm individuals. A picture of a single road flooded over could divert efforts prematurely. But understanding the difference of how damages affect road travel, port availability, and alternate solutions, the difference between data and operational context helps provide the solutions for how mobility support can impact our emergency life-saving activities. Uh, we did find that individual dwelling on a single bridge did not affect the trafficability of main supply routes, for example between one major um, A-pod to another or S-pod um, in addition to, to, to everything else. So it was a matter of the differentiation between individual data points and the operational context as it, fits, uh, as it influences mission success. Training objectives for future exercises and associated references are already being adjusted to ensure that any of the limitations we discovered last winter will not be repeated. And I've got an entire team of engineers working across the Southcom enterprise to ensure that all those lessons learned um, from, from the real world event are captured in future exercises and reference material. So that after my tenure is complete, after everyone else's tenure is complete, we shouldn't fall under any of the same challenges or dilemmas that we faced last November. Although humanitarian assistance and disaster relief activities can involve a variety of engineer tasks from construction to environmental to cultural to operational energy elements, our predominant efforts during the hurricanes honed in toward infrastructure. And so our wicked problem was understanding what was damaged, what actions need to be taken to save lives, and what infrastructure is affected that supports the military operations to support those um, life-saving activities. As mentioned before, a crosstalk with Southcom engineers, as well as other enablers to include logistics, intelligence, operations, and planning, all oversaw ownership of different elements that linked to infrastructure. You quickly discovered that there was a J2 component with geospatial, there was a J4 component with um, uh, through the um, through through port access, there was a, a J3 component for critical infrastructure as an extension of force protection activities. Uh, the, and these traditionally fall outside of the engineer lead efforts here. Engineers became the face of these discussions for the command. I would present daily to the the commander um, during the command update brief, informing the entire enterprise on lines of communication. However, behind the scenes, we brought together everyone together early and often to provide solutions for the commander to make appropriate command decisions. Our resources in this effort extended beyond typical military resources, typical U.S. Southcom internal systems. It also expanded out to the Pacific Disaster Center, to MAGE, to FAA and airport NOTAMs, to existing relationships with seaport harbor masters, Leveraging the partner nation FEMA operations through the SCO, so for example, COPECO in Honduras, and any other tools that helped us provide understanding, analysis, and, and, and a situational awareness of the infrastructure effects as it affects operations and missions. All of this helped shape how engineers collectively level set and what uh, level set what was and how the command could best use our tools available to save lives, improve lines of communication, and remain that trusted partner for Latin America. And so as my final slide, what was the end result? 
Well, you can see the, the numbers here, 850 people saved, 275 missions accomplished, 18 million in humanitarian aid distributed, um, and, and other activities. And so as we pivot from U.S. military contributions and efforts that helped save those lives in, in that period of, of, of dire need and disarray, um, one of the pre-brief asks was, from, from my opinion, how could industry, how could professional military engineers, how could the larger American engineer community um, best support Southern Command or the Western Hemisphere? And, and, and my response is probably a little bit more generic than would be expected, but I did see five areas where industry could potentially best support and best um, orchestrate their thoughts and emphasis. And so when you look at the environment, each country is unique. They have their own priorities, limitations, and other challenges. Industry initiatives to elect how they scope their focus, whether it's focus or scale within a, a, a smaller footprint, an individual country put, footprint, or across an entire region, will help shape their, actually, their ability to react for any potential events, whether it's focused on crisis response events, or if it's focused on nation building, nation rebuilding, uh, they, they may elect to see what challenges face with each individual country or countries, plural, that they could navigate through versus uh, they may find too many challenges to, to attempt to um, uh, uh, seek forth with. In terms of the requirement, understanding each country's governmental capabilities, their needs, and how that's shaped by the nature of an event, as well as any U.S. response from the specific offense, will, will definitely help industry prepare for how they could support as an additive to a U.S. government response. Um, yeah, to, to a U.S. government uh, response. Establishing areas of expertise, whether based on location, skills, or other capabilities, can definitely help shape industry integration. Um, industry engagement by remaining vigilant on Western Hemisphere activities definitely informs their integration. A industry decision to navigate toward a Nicaragua or a Venezuela or Cuba um, may pose more challenges than a Colombia or a Brazil or, or, or one of the democratic nations based on their level of, of political ma maturity. Establishing those areas of expertise, again, based on location, skills, or other capabilities will help shape the uh, industry's integra integration. Industry engagement with remaining vigilant on the Western Hemisphere act activities informs their integration. This expands to dialogues with established engineer agencies on the military side, like USACE, like NAFAC, to solicit capabilities and response to requirements. And so those are, those are longstanding established processes whether it's Jacksonville or whether it's Mobile, understanding, um, you know, projects that are made available, activities that are made available, getting a sense of, of what future um, environmental changes may, may influence um, how things will shift. And, and that gets me to my final point, which is the political landscape. When you look at the industry's village, vigilance on the political landscape, it also informs, I would say, in four-year increments, um, based on U.S. prioritization and response. And that's, that's really based on a presidential uh, administration tenure, four to eight years. So when you look at the shift uh, uh, the, with the, um, the recent introduction of the Biden administration, you're already starting to get a sense that there's going to be a renewed emphasis on climate change. And there's already discussions that are coming up on the Northern Triangle, of Honduras, El Salvador, and Guatemala. And so these are just two examples of how a U.S. government approach has shifted recently based on the administration change. And it also influences uh, uh, industry on areas and, and, and types of engineering capability or surge that industry may elect to emphasize in the coming years. And so um, with that, that was a quick snapshot of, of U.S. Southern Command, of how we dealt with the back-to-back -back hurricanes last November, and potential um, recommendations to industry on, on how they could integrate and, and, and contribute to assisting with not just Southern Command, not just the Department of Events, 
defense, but the, the, the U.S. as a whole, as we all contribute to, to be part of, that, part of that trusted partner, part of that reliable partner of choice within our neighborhood. And with that, uh, this concludes my formal portion of the uh, presentation, and, and I'll open it up for any uh, discussions. Hey, hey, Dave, this is Blair. Uh, thank you very much. That, that, was a, that was a great brief um, and spurred a lot of questions, actually, a lot of thoughts. So I'm going to go ahead and tee up a couple of them for you. So uh, to quote you, um, you had to be quickly and decisively integrate. I thought that was, a, that was a great line. And unlike the other combatant commands, I mean, you, you somewhat are, are similar to Africa Command. You have a neighborhood. You've got a lot of distinct countries that are very different. Um, so there certainly are, have to be capability gaps that, that Southern Command experiences. Which one specifically? So we're going to see if we can push you a little bit or dig a little bit deeper. You mentioned climate change. Instant, ironically, you mentioned, mentioned translation, which is not one that I would have thought would be a capability gap. But where are those capability gaps do you see where potentially the AE industry or industry writ large uh, could really help you? Um, no, I, I think that's a that's a good question. Um, I, I, you know, I wish I wish I had a, a, a good answer on that one. The, um, you know, the, the the challenges we faced is we were able to, as Southern Command, based on ODACA and our um, our our mandates and authorities, we were able to get countries past the emergent the, the immediate response get people out of harm's way and try to build back as the environment subsided. And so when you have hurricanes, you have floods, you have potential damages to, to infrastructure, but at, at, the, at the core of everything was saving lives. And so our mandate was really, let's get in early because we need to surge in for that immediate response. You know, th there isn't days, weeks, months waiting for people to, to orchestrate and, and respond. We, we are, we are first responders in, in that regard, and, and, that's, and that would be expected of any neighbor when their house is on fire. We helped each partner nation, in this case, the, the, the eight different countries, get past the immediate life-saving hurdle. Afterwards, our intention was to fade away and allow other governments, other nations, um, the partner nation themselves, be able to take control and be able to help stabilize their countryside. And so we, we had a very fine um, um, metric of, of, of what our mandate was, and that was the life-saving piece. Just because the hurricanes are gone doesn't mean that, you know, everything is back to normal. There are still damages that exist today. There was extensive flood damages. Um, shortly after the second hurricane, there was a volcano that was potentially going to erupt in Guatemala. I mean, there were other things that were, you know, things that were going around. And, and so, you know, we were vigilant for the peripherals. But when, when you look at those capability gaps, we were limited because of U.S. mandate on what we could and could not do. And, and I would have loved to have served a whole bunch of military engineers and started rebuilding every bridge and dam and road and port and pier and everything. I just couldn't do that. And so there's definitely a need. The countries, you know, in some cases – are not mature enough to be able to, to, to be able to recover themselves. And so, and there's a level of technical competency that also comes with each nation. And, you know, some are high and some are not as high. And so when you look at industry perspectives, do, you, do they need to be held back with a U.S. military identification to pull them in, to, to go surge in for a Honduras or a Salvador or a Costa Rica? Not necessarily. You know, it's, 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 it's definitely... Um, you know, advantageous for any industry counterpart to look at what had been damaged and see how they can contribute. I and mean, obviously, there's mutual benefits. The, the the partner nation would recover to a degree. The 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 industry partner would, in addition to you know, prescribe let's say financial gain. You know, it also as a as a let's say a U.S. representation. Um, you know, obviously is is implicitly on behalf of their their country of origin, and so. You know, it definitely extends to uh, America's ability to be that trusted neighbor. It, it doesn't have to be a soldier, serviceman, uh, a sailor, or marine. It, it, you know, anyone who's a, a American can can be a, a professional engineer and be able to say, "Hey, I'm I'm a part of this as well." You know, I may not be wearing a suit, but I, I care just as much, and, and we're going to take care of you because we're neighbors.
I, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, D David did. And there was a there was a corollary question to that. Um, was asked about did you say Sandor Navfac join in the relief effort? So I guess as you know, you talked about the first response and then being a good neighbor. Was there any? Um, was there a chance for USACE or NAVFAC to assist in theater security cooperation and um, facilitate getting some of those uh, those private sector uh, capabilities into these countries? Yes, so the first hurricane shifted out of um, the Central America and started heading toward Cuba. And so as it, as it started ripping through the Caribbean, you definitely had a NAVFAC presence and oversight. Fortunately, in that case, there, there was little damage, let alone damage that, that required U.S. response to. Um, the second event that ripped through Honduras also passed through the, the Colombian islands, Providencia and San Andreas. And with, with Providencia in particular, it ended up being 95% devastation of that island. As I mentioned before, we had four presence with USAID, and that included a major who was out of Bogota. And working through this, the Security Cooperation Office and the Embassy, we were actually able to get that major's boots on the ground in Providencia and, and give us probably the, the, most, the most detailed initial report on Providencia. And it helped shape the commander, understand the situation without him having to fly around to all eight, nine countries and see it for himself. In, in addition, there were USACE elements that were surged into Honduras. Um, there were other military engineers, um, even beyond USACE and NAFAC. You know, there was... There, there was presence with the, uh, the, the Joint Task Force and the military uh, engineers and civil affairs. And so there was definitely a, a series of, of, of capable service members that were, that were across. We ended up using uh, some non-traditional elements. And so Transcom would come in and send, because, you know, as Transcom, they have to fly in the, to airstrips and, and ports. And so they have their own assessment capabilities. And so the, the response, you know, went beyond Southcom. And this... I, I would say three combatant commands surged in to help assist with, with the assessment piece, in addition to other activities. Uh, we also had activities with um, uh, partner nations. And so when you look at the uh, satellite imagery or the uh, inf uh, intelligence collection, you know, the, getting the imagery of a bridge or a port or whatnot, you know, we were cross-sharing with, with other nations. And so, you know, it wasn't just, it wasn't just Southcom, it wasn't just the task force, it wasn't just USAID and NAFAC. I mean, you're talking about countries and you're talking about multiple combatant commands that definitely contributed for this, for this. And it definitely was, I mean, in my, in my, my opinion, a whole of a government, both military and civil, uh, and, and the other agencies, um, whole of government approach for us. And I think it, I think it spoke volumes, you know, when, when, when pushed in, uh, pushed into a corner, you know, who's your first call to? You're welcome. Hey, Dave, that was a great, uh, great answer. Those, to give credit to where those questions did come from, Chris and Sharice, I appreciate those. Uh, Darshan has a question for you, and I'm actually going to read it. It's a pretty interesting one. How did the emergency response team manage the response effort, effort in the COVID pandemic environment? Did it delay to, to some degree or, or cause any hesitation um, in the response? So how, how, would, how did you view the response in terms of COVID? Did it change how you would have thought or would have liked it should have gone or, or would no effect? Um, there was definitely an effect. Uh, and, and I'll say that there's an effect in, in two pieces. Here at Southern Command, um, when you look at January, February, March, when everyone is starting to look at, you know, teleworking or reducing um, in-person presence, you know, Southern Command was, was, was no different. The, the, the commander was adamant about strictly adhering to DOD COVID compliance and, and, and guidance. And so, you know, the masks and the distance and the shielding between cubicles and, and the amount of personnel that would, that would operate uh, telework versus in-person, you know, th those all made, made uh, changes. In addition to that, w we became comfortable with working from our stations and operating virtually. And so, whereas you would have a jock floor that surges in 100 people, we could have a jock floor of 10, knowing that everyone else within the headquarters, for example, can operate just as easily from their, their um, individual office and cubicle and still be able to contribute to get the commander the information he needs to make those command decisions. And so we had about six months of, of, of operating like that in a COVID environment. We did do the typical ramp up for crisis action and, and, and all that, but you know, a lot of it was a pseudo reach back 
with a lot of people working at their own workstations across the entire headquarters. With the boots on the ground and the surging of personnel, each country, and we monitor this, we monitor this all the time, each country has its own COVID stipulations. Some countries may be more stringent or less stringent. And so um, in some cases, before you could step foot out of the um, public community, if you do, the typical two-week ROM. You know, this isn't just an American requirement. You know, this is, this is all over the world, and, and, and Central America, South America is no different. Under these emergency conditions, uh, we were able to, based on the equivalent of pre-mobilization activities, ROM, pre, uh, pre-mob activities stateside, getting into controlled environments, mill, air, or transport into a, a forward operating station, and the, the amount of contact with other personnel that were in compliance, there are ways that we were able to mitigate. Also working with the individual countries and their typical, um, their, their typical pre-event uh, quarantine standards versus in the cases of emergency, how there's, there's some risk that could be assumed at the command level. And so all these things were taken into consideration as we look to reduce the time to get additional bodies in the country to help save lives. Great. And I've got just a couple more questions. We've got an awful lot today, but I'm going to ask you a personal one here. So it was interesting what you just said is that COVID forced you to, or forced you to uh, separate people away from the jock floor, which is very interesting from your experience in Korea where you went to CP Tango and there wasn't a, a single, single space available in the combined operations center. Um, no personal space at all. So as you, as you went from that environment, I know you had experience in CENTCOM, what most surprised you when you got to um, to Southern Command, and then what's different about Southern Command or unique? Um, so you, you're absolutely correct. My my experience in, uh, having worked in Korea, you know, you enter. I mean, it's like you know a couple of locations around the world. You enter the side of a mountain, and you've got about thirty people on top of each other in a small little area, and that's and that's where the uh, let's say the command engineer operates out of. So it's kind of hard to to get a little bit of breathing room. Um, there's definitely a lot more space, and, and, and it's a double-edged sword. You know, you kind of like rolling up your sleeves and really, you know, you know pulling out the pencil and, and you know, the ruler and, and making calculations and, you know, kind of working through stuff with your partners. And, and, and you don't get that personal interaction when you're in a COVID environment. And so in the absence of that, the collaboration tools that are available, the, um, you know, the reliance on virtual or telephonic communication sources, you know, that becomes the new norm of, of collaboration. And so, you know, we, we, started to, we started to really champion MS Teams and their online collaboration tools, you know, where you, where you could work. So there's that, 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 that virtual component. Um, w- w- when you look at the, the, the COVID environment, um, the, the best thing that I experienced with Southern Command was one challenge doesn't bring you down. Yeah, you're kind of dealing this, but we're all dealing the same thing. And it's not just the engineers. It's not just Southern Command. Everyone's fighting under the same, the same dynamic. And so instead of looking at that as a negative, just extenuate the positive. How do, you, how do you go around the issue to get the commander where he can achieve success? And so 10 bodies in a jock versus 80, nope, not gonna slow us down. We're just gonna change the manner in which we all communicate. And some people are in person, some people can run down things, but it just becomes a shift. And then more importantly, the commander's appreciation that under these restrictions, you may not necessarily get um, as, as expedient a response as you would typically get in, an, uh, in another environment. So, you know, with, with given limitations and what the challenges are, the, the subordinate general officer, flag officers, the senior um, officers and advisors, you know, they all help paint the picture that, you know, this is, um, we're, we're getting to yes, but there's to a part of a, a level of tactical patience that is kind of, not saying that we're going to delay for months before we give you a response. We understand we're all saving lives here in this event, um, but, you know, we are working. And so it, it becomes an, an um, expectation management. And so um, and, and that was that echelon. And the commander really helped champion that. He, he just he wanted to he wanted to more than anyone roll up the sleeves and help us get us to yes, help us get us to success. How do we save lives? 
And so I think he appreciated more than most that, that we're all fighting in the same environment, himself included. And so, you know, we got to work together as a team. And Dave, we're going to put you on the spot for one last question. Lori asked a question, and it's kind of a corollary to what you just, just answered. How do you think this could or should change business in the future? Is it going to change how we operate as a military and a combatant command? So I would tell you that I think there's a financial component to the virtual environment. I know that a lot of people feel compelled that every single meeting has to be in person. Every single conference has to be in person. And I, I think, again, double-edged sword. If there's a conference at Fort Polk, it'd be great to throw out the card. I don't need to go to central Louisiana. I'll just, I'll just virtually tile in. Um, but if it's in Venice, I might want to fly there, but there's an associated cost. And so, you know, the double-edged sword of embracing the virtual, um, the, the virtual dynamic uh, versus everything having to be in person. You, you definitely get a lot of stuff accomplished um, with, with the in-person setting, but, you know, I think, I think across the military and I, I think across the government, um, we're more and more proving that uh, virtual forums can be just as effective, just as successful in many occasions. And that's going to allow something like budgets to shift to other important things. I mean, when you look at the Biden administration looking to champion uh, more infrastructure statewide, or I'm sorry, nationwide, um, that could be in part due to a reduction of um, conferences or other things that may have been taken for granted 24 months ago as necessary for in-person. And so I think, I think there's goodness to it. What I would also tell you is over time, uh, I, I think it's, uh, it's going to get forgotten. I mean, and, and I'll use two examples. People kept correlating COVID to the Spanish flu of 1920. You know, the, 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 the reaction that they had then with their masks or their whatever, 100 years later, are we doing that? I don't know. We really had a patriotic sense of 9-11 for many years. We still do at Patriots Day, et cetera. But, you know, lest we forget Pearl Harbor Day. And so from 19, you know, from the 1940s to now, how did Pearl Harbor Day kind of fade into the distance? Not that it's forgotten, but less emphasized. And so I think over time, you know, what we experience as isolated, immediate, and tragic events of COVID, I, I think, unfortunately, over time will subside and, and will go back into more in-person, but definitely does not, does not lose the, the, the ability and the, um, the importance of trying to maintain as much virtual as possible um, because of, of, of the goodness and utility that comes of it. Dave, Colonel Noble, thank you so much for your, your time today, taking it out of your certainly busy schedule at, at Southern Command. Kind of interesting, it's almost like we have a case study here, the response to COVID and simultaneously an environmental event that you were, the South Com, Southern Command responded to. Some great lessons learned here that I hope are not forgotten. And I hope we do improve how we as a military and how we as the private sector support the military. It's a great opportunity to look at ourselves and do a lessons learned and, and um, get better for the next one that's inevitable. So again, thank you very much for your time. I will give you one last second. Is there any other closing comment you want to add to the group before we wrap it up? No, I just thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk. I'm glad that as professional engineers, we get together from time to time to share ideas and also to see how each other operate, you know, as, as kind of a Rorschach or litmus test as we operate ourselves, you know, so uh, part of the larger engineer community you know, at the end of the day, we're all trying to make America, you know, the best we, we can, both internally and externally. And, and it's things like this that help us advocate and champion that those ideals. So thank you for the opportunity. Nope. Thank you very much. Hey, for the group, appreciate you joining us. Hope, it, hope you enjoyed it as much as we did. Uh, there are PDH credits available for this. I'll, ap I'll uh, apologize on behalf of uh, myself and the staff. We had our COVID moment and it first published or posted the wrong PDH for this certificate. The correct one is now there. So we recovered and we're, we're good to go and you're welcome to download it and use it. One of the other questions we had was, how do I get a copy of this brief? Well, go over to the handouts tab on the top right of, your, um, of, the, of the chat box and the handout is there and available for you. So if you do have any questions for Dave or for the or about Southern Command, do not hesitate to reach out and ask him or, or reach out to us. And remind your friends and neighbors that this is also available as a podcast. It's been recorded and you can listen, your friends can listen to it at a future event once we're, um, 
Once we're out of COVID and driving places again, what a great way to uh, spend the time in the car. So thanks again, Dave. Jill, thanks. Thank you for, um, for running this as you always do. Uh, Chris, unless you have something else, I'm going to sign us off. And with the silence, Jill, I think we're done. Thank you very much, everyone. Have a great day.